Welcome back, everybody. And as I promised you uh, in uh, this week's lecture, we've got another special surprise uh, this week. I am particularly uh, happy and honored uh, to have with us Professor Mary Morgan, who has very, very kindly agreed to spend half an hour with us uh, to talk about narratives, which is the topic that we're covering uh, this, uh, this week. Mary, thank you so much for being with us. It's great to be here. Thank you. So Mary is Professor of History of Economics at the London School of Economics, but she's also an amazing friend of our department. And uh, I hope she considers our department as a friend of uh, the uh, uh, Narrative Science um, project. So Mary, I've got a few questions for you. Some are about narratives in particular, but I would like to start a little bit before that. So. Um, your first degree is in economics, uh, if uh, I am right. And we, I was wondering how and when did you discover history and philosophy of science? And how did you decide to have a whole career in this field? Yeah, OK, that's a very good question. And, and I actually end up now being a professor of history and philosophy of economics. So gradually, the philosophy has crept in. So. Um, I, it's a pretty serendipitous story, actually. Um, I um, dropped out of my first university, which just shows there's hope for all of us. Um, and um, I spent some time doing various things, including I ended up working at a bank in the economics department, a, a commercial bank in the economics department. And then I realized I couldn't get on without a degree. So I went to the LSE um, and to study economics and economic history. and. Then I went to work at the Bank of England, the central bank, um, and um, the career path shut down because of various political events. So my department was shut down. So I went back to the LSE and was looking for something to do. And I started a PhD on the history of econometrics, which is the statistical um, end of economics, very technical part. Um, and I had the incredible good luck in my third year of my PhD to be invited to spend a year on a project called the Prohibilistic Revolution Project mm. in Bielefeld in Germany. And this was a project um, which was taking off from Ian Hacking's work, whom I think you've been reading Ian's work, his work on the history of probability and statistical thinking. And it was run by a very eminent professor, German professor Lawrence Kruger. And it was a group of 21 odd scholars and we had lots of people coming and going uh, for various workshops. So Ian was the kind of great intellectual leader, but Norton Wise was there and John Beatty, who's a very renowned philosopher of biology. And then the most, there was a, a junior group of which I was the most junior because I was still doing my PhD. And the next most junior person was Ted Porter, who's mm. the person in the history of statistics. Rainy Daston, who is, was the director of the Max Planck on History of Science um, and uh, various sort of a, a young group like this. So I had incredible good luck to be spending a year there. And that's how I essentially became um, an HPS person because I was working on my own on history of econometrics and suddenly this whole new area opened up. So that's how I got to be an HPS person working in an economics department or an economic history department, which is where I am now. This is amazing. I wish I, I were a fly on the wall in that uh, <laughs> gathering of minds. <laughs> I didn't know this story, Mary. It's really, really amazing. It's incredible. Well, it was an amazing group and an amazing year, and I was incredibly lucky. And it's incredible how then that kind of group of people continued to collaborate afterwards. So, yeah. I mean, that makes me hope that the friends that I am making now oh, will yes. continue uh, somehow to con collaborate in the future. So your, your work is like really central to debates in history and philosophy of science. It has, has really changed the field, it has defined the field in many ways, from models to scientific facts, uh, to of course philosophy of the social sciences more broadly, but how specifically did you come to work on narratives, right, which are such a niche area in the history of analytical, in, 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 in analytical philosophy, let alone philosophy of science? Yeah, well, it's a, 
it actually it actually goes back to the work on models i began this project in the 90s with margaret morrison mm. on models in mm. science and it was a joint project between um lse um, and Amsterdam, where I then was, and I had a department of economics in Amsterdam, and the LSE department was very focused on physics at that time, and we had a joint uh, working group on models in economics and physics, and we would, we, we, I mean, this course is about conversations, we really set out to change the conversation on models in this project. At that time, the literature on models was about what a model was, how you defined a model. And what we were interested in is what do scientists do with models? How do they use them? How do they reason with them? How do they function? So we explicitly wanted to change the conversation. And I think we succeeded much more than I expected. <laughs> but that was the critical kind of focus. Now, um, as part of that, um, I was interested in the way economists use models. And I was in an economics and economic history department. And I recalled from my studies and from my PhD work and after that there's this very strange way in which economists use narratives in the classroom, in the mm. professional seminar system. So you might go to a seminar in economics and an economist would put a theoretical model on the board and then they would have this very funny construction. They would say, and the story here would be mm. as they were using the model to answer questions about what would happen if this model was the real, was the world uh, that you were in? What would happen if we changed this parameter or altered that term? And they would roll out an account of what would happen in this model world, and they'd call it a story. Mm. And then on the other side, I would go to econometric seminars where econometricians and historians would have real data, and they'd be running causal models to explain what had happened in the world. And they would have two sets of criteria, a statistical set of criteria, and then they'd have a second set of criteria, which were economic criteria. And someone, very often the most senior professor present, would say, but what would the story here be? That is, what is the causal account you're making a claim about here? How does the world that you're representing in your model really work? Um, so that whole practice space of economics depended on a narrative practice. Um, mm. <laughs> and uh, there are one, one or two funny pieces actually in the history of economics about how um, God made economists as storytelling people, um, <laughs> because that recognizes this kind of practical aspect. So I started getting interested from the work on models on where stories fitted in. And there's a paper way back in 2003 about how um, the model is, the, the mathematical model is part of a piece of the scientific object mm. but how you use it then requires you to, you have a set of a model of stories you can tell and a set of stories you can't tell mm. right so you have a model of this kind it will tell these kind of stories it won't tell those kind of stories at all because they're not represented in the model so the stories a model can tell are part of the identity of the model mm. Mm. in a very real way because mm. they're the model constrains but also enables that set of stories and rules out another set of stories mm. um, so i got interested in the way theoretical models and stories interacted and this kind of interesting aspect that actually the identity of the model is very much bound up in the possible things it can tell you about mm. that is uh, the narratives um, so that's how I got into interested in narratives, um, and then that kind of got a bit wider. Um, and um, Norton Wise had a wonderful project in the first decade of the century on on called the Science Without Laws. I think is referenced in your reading list somewhere, um, and the subtitle is important. I have to get it here: Model Systems, Cases, and Exemplary Narratives. Mm. Now. This was at the point when physics, was, which, which was the philosophy of science uh, field, was giving way to biology is the field that we all need to understand and work on. Um, and so these um, the science without laws is an explicit reference to how do we have to rethink history, philosophy of science when we have a field which is bio biology and which doesn't have laws in the yeah. same way that physics has laws 
Yeah, right? yeah. So this is a completely new space in which we have to think about models, cases, and narratives. Mm -hmm. So that's when I worked on the prisoner's dilemma case, which again is a case where the identity of the model is partly uh, bound into the text account, the narrative account that tells you how to use them. What, what is possible is the other way around. Mm. The narrative here tells you what kind of things you can do in the model, mm. as opposed to the other cases, the model tells you what possible narratives you can tell. Mm. So the, the Oh. Mary, I think you froze for one second. Closeness of the mathematics, the, the formal, and so that's how I mm. got into narratives, and I see that my connection is unstable. So yeah, yeah, I think you froze for one second, uh, but we were getting, I think it, we got almost to the end of, uh, you know, the, the <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, so, Okay, so the, what I really kind of, uh, one of the things that I take from this is the importance of really zooming in on, on practice, but not just on practice in, in general, but on the kind of granularity of scientific practices and on like how different kinds of narratives play different kinds of roles depending on aims, goals, values and communities that are using them as well, which I think is uh, a little bit one of the one of the messages that I take from from your paper uh, that we've read uh, this week on on narratives on the very different ways in which uh, um, um, uh, uh, particular aspects of a narrative travel, so the methodological aspects versus the exemplary case and the differences in the use and uh, and in particular, the, one of the things that seems to be really important for you is that narrative is not a static and fixed conception, but it's something that is done in different ways, right? Yes, indeed. Yeah, it's it's a um, it, it 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 comes in lots of varieties and mm. it fulfills lots of different functions for lots of different scientists. Not in all sciences at all times. Yes, but at particular sites in particular ways right. at particular different times. Yeah. yeah. So there is one thing that has been puzzling me, and it's the question of time. I still cannot make up my mind on whether time may be an important ordering criterion in um, narratives and narrative um, uh, ordering. You clearly think it isn't, right? Um, but I'm thinking about whether this is a peculiarity of the social sciences and whether time might play a more important role in the historical sciences, um, in paleontology, for example, or in geology or in archeology, span or even in history, if we want to sort of go with the philosophers of history and trying to establish what is the nature of the explanations that historians come up with and whether they are narrative in, in nature. Mm. Yeah, I, it's a really it's a really interesting nexus of things, um, and it, and the problem about time I think comes from two places. Mm. One is that if you look at narrative theory, narratologists take it absolutely for granted. Probably there's surely someone who doesn't, so I'm laying my neck, you know, laying out here. But the, you know, the general rule is time has to be there. Mm. Uh, and it may not be, it may be your narrative doesn't just go through time in an ordered way, but that events happen in time, even if you don't report them or you don't remember them or they don't appear on the page in time. Mm. But the time is your basic ordering uh, device mm. uh, for the way you put together the things. Um, and as I think in, in the reading that you've been said, I make a, an argument that, yeah, that's true for chronology, mm. but it's not necessarily true for narratives in sciences. That is, I don't want to say time's not there. Right? Mm. What I want to say is it's not the most important thing there, mm. right? Um, so um, if we think about a natural historical science for a moment, and we think about um, paleontology or geology or any of the natural historical sciences, of course it matters that those sciences are about things that have happened through time. Mm. But very often, the scientist is not interested in the time relation. So if you remember from the paper, if you've 
managed to get around to reading it. The chronology is just the order of events in time and the narrative joins up those events. Mm. They are relational. Yeah. And the point about putting them in order is not just because they're in a time order, but to show and discover and reveal and think about the relationships between those events, right? If mm. this king followed that king, is it because the second one had murdered the first one? Mm. Or was the son of the first one, right? The important thing is about <clears throat> the relationships between them. And that's more important than whether they, whether King, second king came to the throne in 1587 or 1584 or 1586. Right? That's mm. not really the most important thing about that narrative. It's about mm. the other relations. Mm. So if we think about, well, actually one of my favorite um, cases that's coming into the narrative science book is by someone with a MSc from your department, um, Andrew Hopkins, mm -hmm. who, um, was a professional geologist um, for many years before he became a, an HPS person. And he's got a very nice case in the narrative science book, which we're planning, uh, which is about um, the cause of a particular rock outcrop in northwest Scotland. Mm -hmm. Now, the basic account of how that rock output uh, was was laid down, uh, began uh, in the late 19th century version of this, that it was just laid down as a set of um, kind of alluvial plains, right? Mm. So it just kind of came up a set of normal geological kind of um, processes. Um, and then somebody came along and said, oh, look, there's this particular kind of stone in it, uh, which we find with volcanoes. Okay. So perhaps this formation is the cause of, a, is, is come from a volcano. Mm. Um, now, there's no sign of the volcanic vent, but we have this other piece of evidence which suggests it's caused by a volcano. Mm. And then someone came along much more recently and said, oh, look, there's this piece of evidence here, which suggests it actually comes from a meteorite uh, hitting the area. Now, we have three completely different causal accounts. None of them really depend very much on exactly where Any of these things happened. Of course, they happened in the past, but the tongue is not so important as the cause of them. Mm. And the fact that there's no evidence of the meteorite crater and no evidence of the volcanic vent <laughs> is the real problem here, yeah, right? Yeah, not yeah. whether or not we can really put it back into time. So our narrative, the narrative account of this has changed twice in very dramatic form, mm. but the narrative account is about how this piece of rock formation was caused and laid down. Mm. that's where the narrative is not in the time relations okay it's just it's, like the king uh, whether he's murdered or whether he's just come to the throne because he's mm. his son so of course time is there but time is not the dominant ordering device that we need to make our scientific accounts mm. whole it's the other stuff right and this is really interesting because it kind of shows that when um philosophers of history use time as a parameter, they might actually be embracing a very narrow view of what history is all about. I, so, you know, like thinking about history in relational terms might dispel the typical student fear that in order to know history, they need to remember a lot of dates. And that is like, I think, symptom, a symptom of a very narrow view of what history is about, whereas history is about relate the relations between elements and maybe like thinking beyond time is one of the, the ways in which we can think about history differently, more much more broadly. So this is really helpful and it has completely brought me to the side. I was already convinced by your argument, but now I have no doubts anymore. <laughs> It is interesting that history matters here in this account because you know if we're HPS people we've got this these history historical accounts and of course time in a sense does matter more for historians it does matter exactly who came after whom um, because right it matters to the way we think about the history of ideas and the history of practices so it's a probably more important template um, yeah. if you're thinking about the history of science but I don't think that means that we should take it as the bedrock of our scientific explanations if we're philosophers of science. That's, yeah, that's, yeah. that's the, the more important point about it. Yes, yes, thank you. So the, the narrative science project, it seems to me, has moved 
beyond the question of explanation and it has now really kind of begun to explore more broadly how scientists have a much broader range of uses for, for narratives. The, the website very specifically says we are taking narrative in the broadest possible sense because we are interested in precisely the diversity of like uses that there are for, for narratives. So are you willing to share a couple of highlights of what you are discovering? You've already given us an example from geology that was really like fascinating and super illuminating, but anything else? And I'm particularly curious about how scientists are receiving the idea that they are narrators. Are they happy with it? <laughs> Well, uh, okay, let me get to that, but that last one first. I mean, I don't know to what extent any HPS or ST really speaks to scientists. Um, I do know that actually in economics, just, you know, which is my starting field, um, there is sudden huge interest in narratives. Mm. Um, and we have a Nobel Prize winner who's written a book called Narrative Economics. We have another very senior uh, woman economist who's uh, coined a phrase called uh, narrative economics, uh, which is somewhat different, which uh, in that case means attention to the, to the text analysis of the minutes of the central bank meetings. Uh, we have people working on um, the narratives of non-quantitative data that are, mm -hmm. that are used as part of the information system in the economy. Um, we have people thinking about um, our policymakers being held by narratives of how the world works when the world is working differently. Mm -hmm. So in fact, it's suddenly become only in the last two years, um, a possible thing for me to be talking about. <laughs> um, and so I have suddenly found myself um, back into the economics community. Um, it's not that they've thrown me out, but they've suddenly begun to recognize that I'm talking about something they're interested in, which is very nice. Um, <laughs> Uh, let me go back to the narrative science project. So the narrative science project has been absolutely wonderful. I've just loved it because it's um, a project which is about narrative in any science that we come across. We've got five, we've had, we've had five postdocs, six postdocs, um, and they've all been working on different things. Um, and um, we are bringing together, we've brought together one anthology, which um, Kiara has been kind enough to put on your reading list. There's another one coming, although I think it won't now be till after Christmas, because we're currently trying to get 21 chapters of a narrative science book together. Um, now, one of the frames I think that's quite interesting here is the number of papers, and, and these are a mixture of history and philosophy of science scholars and a few people from narrative theory. Mm. Um, we have someone from argumentation theory, um, mm. uh, Paul Almos, who's very interesting about, who's done an analysis actually of the special, um, the studies in history of philosophy of science about the papers there. We've got someone who writes about the narrative aspects versus the technical aspects of papers. So we've got people who are really focused on exactly how the words and the arguments are working. But one of the things that's really come up is um, there's a kind of sense in the narrative theory space that narratives can only be found in words. Mm. This is deeply problematic if you're an HPS person, because whatever field you're looking at is going to have graphs and diagrams and equations and who know what. Right. And so one of the things we've been tracking and kind of trying to put together in the volume is um, accounts of how scientists read narratives off graphs, graphs mm. or read narratives into experiments. So that whole relationship between um, representation and narrative, which to allow the representation not to be in words, but to be in other modes of expression, which is really important in many sciences. So mm -hmm. that's one of the areas we've really broken open, I think, in a very interesting way. And that's made us think about how do people read time in, in diagrams, mm -hmm. if there is time. In some fields, they read it up. In some fields, they read it right to left. In some fields, they write left to right. Um, so you need to know what field you're in in order to even read time. And of mm -hmm. course, not all of these diagrams are time-based. They are other um, framings. So if you're thinking about a sets of diagrams that relate, very often you're reading a causal structure across time. Um, you might be reading um, a set of events, as in the geology case, of different points of 
the way in which the materials from an explosion or a, a crater uh, impact fall onto the ground and create um, sediments. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a whole set of things like that. And then there's a very nice paper, which I hope that when the book comes out, I might try and even get it in circulation before by Norton Wise about the relationship between our formal languages in science, mm. these diagrams, these equations and so forth, and the natural languages that the narrative narratologists talk about. Mm. And therefore the narratives you can tell in that informal languages and the narratives you tell in um, the natural languages. Okay, mm. so you've got formal language and natural language and formal narratives and <laughs> natural narratives. Mm. Sorry, it's getting a bit complicated, but how those all relate is a really interesting question. And Norton's written a very nice short piece about that, including a very nice analysis of Faraday and, mm. and his way, his double way of thinking about uh, about this natural and, and formal. So that's one area I think we've we've really broken out. Um, I think the other one is going back to my desire that we think about verbs, not nouns. Mm. We can think about narratives as a representational device in science. You can have models represent things, and we can have equations represent things, we can have diagrams represent things, and we can have narratives. Hmm. Taking narratives as a noun, this narrative can represent this set of arrangements or this set of relations. Hmm. But we can also think, and I think this is where we've really pushed op open the, the kind of the gates, is hmm. that what scientists are doing um, in, ma in making narratives is making sense. So this isn't quite the same as a claim to explanation, but mm. when scientists are working on their materials, experiments, diagrams, whatever, they are all the time uh, trying to make sense of the world there, the phenomena they're investigating. Mm. And very often that informal sense-making is a process of narrative making, is mm. how does this stuff fit together? If we do this, what happens? Uh, and what's the sequence of events that happen? Mm. So it doesn't always get, put straight in or even ever in to the narrative or the written paper is what happens in the lab or in the seminar, just as I experienced in economics a long time ago, right? It's making sense of stuff. So the narrative, the, the ability of narrative as a sense-making machine, I think is a really uh, important part of what we're finding. So. You know, we're interested in the functions of narrative, and I think that's a really important one. Of course, there's other functions it plays in various ways, but not all the time, for not all sciences, for not all sites, but a significant place um, for many sciences, not just time-based ones, not just natural historical ones, not just social historical ones like sociology or anthropology, but as a kind of sense-making space mm -hmm. um, in practice, which we're get, it's quite difficult to get at because it is in the practice and we don't necessarily find it in the ground. We're looking for the traces of it, just like geologists and paleontologists <laughs> look for the traces of their fossils. This is absolutely fascinating, Mary. I've got like now lots of ideas on how to include the, uh, the, the narrative science outputs in a lot of my other courses. Uh, when we deal with representations in other modules, uh, that's going to be an absolutely invaluable uh, source. But also it makes me think about, uh, so with maybe with a, with a distinction that the students will be familiar with from last year's course in philosophy of science, they've looked a little bit to the now old fashioned distinction between discovery versus justification. And it seems to me that your approach to narratives is a lot less about a finished product. And it's a lot more about sense making as a process in the making. And I think that is one of the most exciting parts of it because it's so hard to pin down the dynamic sense in which narratives are in use um, in day to day uh, practice. Mm -hmm. um, can I just kind of add, can I add on to that a little bit? Yes. You know, where, where is it that we want us to take us, right? Well, you know, going back to the narrative explanation problem, right? A lot of sciences don't have laws. Mm. So they rely on this relational sense making. So, mm. you know, if you think of an, what is that, what is a narrative, you know, what is a, when you say, well, um, you know, what exactly happened here? Mm. Uh, and then, oh, now I understand, right? Mm. The questions, how did this happen? Why did this happen? 
uh, how did it come about, right? Very often they're answered by narratives that make sense of it. So the explanatory space mm. is not from laws. Yeah. <laughs> it's from this making sense. And then, you know, if you make sense of this here, can you make sense of the equivalent kind of situation over there, the equivalent mm. kind of thing? If we find this kind of rock there, does that mean a meteor was there? So mm. to what extent can we make our narrative accounts, quasi-explanations, travel. And a lot of that depends on the fact that when we're making a sense, we are not making a cut between epistemology and ontology. So this is where I think maybe it's useful, Chiara, to think we're not making a cut because as in a lot of science, they're very closely interlined, right? So you can't say this scientist is doing stuff which is epistemically important and this scientist is doing stuff which is ontologically important. Mm. One of the things that you get out of narratives are the direction of or the, the formation of conceptual spaces, conceptual ideas, right? Mm. So if one replaces laws and thinks, where do the concepts come from? Mm. Well, there's a few accounts in philosophy of science that sort of talk about the imagination and various things, but they don't really pin that down onto practice in the way mm. that I think we could do. So one of the papers from one of the postdocs is a very nice paper about the difference between a research narrative, the narrative a researcher tells about how what he did, and the narrative of nature about what is supposed to be happening in this phenomena. Mm. And it's in that nexus that you get the development of, of terms, concepts, and so forth. So I think the other thing that could be interesting about this, if people want to take it and run with it, is thinking about where concept formation goes on and how often that may or may not come out of some narrativizing activity. Meredith has been absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much for your time. Um, and thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us. Uh, I'm sure the students will have lots of questions in addition to these. I'll try to do my best uh, to <laughs> answer them. Um, and um, I'm really hoping that some of our students will actually take the opportunity to do an assessment, one of the assessments on narratives. And I will definitely let you know how that goes um, if, uh, uh, if that happens. Thank you so much again, uh, Mary. And uh, I um, hope to see all of you again uh, next week for our uh, next um, lecture. I'm going.